Knock knock. Who's there? What is black, white, and red all over? A man walks into a bar with a sun. Did the chicken cross the road? Oh, into a bar. Do you call it a bar? Listening to Making Sense of Humour with Dr. Jay Brinker and Beau Fitzpatrick. Coming up on today's show. I can't imagine a person who never laughed. I just cannot conceive of this. Uh, the French word humeur um, yes. meant odd or peculiar. I find explaining the joke it really works in <laughs> shutting up a room. <laughs> Let me introduce you to someone. If it's still funny, can you still laugh even though you're also cringing? That was Dr. Jay Brinker. She's a clinical psychologist at Swinburne University and a lecturer who specializes in humor studies. Yep, it exists. And I'd like to introduce you to Beau Fitzpatrick, editor of Yacht Magazine. Yep, it exists. Smart ass. And together we bring you a podcast all about humor, when we use it, why we use it, and how we use it in social situations. And it's called Making Sense of Humour. We're going to talk to some comedians, some academics, and some public figures to do just that, make sense of humour. So here we go. Episode 1, I want to make Aristotle laugh. The history of humour, well, our best version of it. It's hard to know where to start, but it's really just a matter of going back as far as you can and starting from there. We were going to start with ancient Greece, but this guy had other ideas. Oh, sure. Look, if you go far enough back, a guy a guy that, you know, that farted into the fire got a big laugh in the cave. That was Mike Wilmot, internationally renowned comedian. Like, I don't put, I put humor up there with cave paintings. Like, if there was a funny cave guy, he wouldn't have to go hunting because there's a chance he'll get killed. So he's, you stay here with the women. We'll go hunt. We'll bring you food. And then you tell stories. Or, and I'm sure that the same guy with the paint, he would paint the ceilings, their adventures. They loved it so much that what we don't want you to come out and hunt because you might get killed. So when, when the leader, the big guy, he would draw him huge on the wall with a giant penis and he would be the charge. <laughs> and then when that guy was killed, he would draw the other guy's face in place. And this is the beginning of art. <laughs> I really believe it. Painting, art, comedy, music, all to stay in the cave with the girls. <laughs> and 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 have the and and eat. Unfortunately, we have no idea based on cave drawings what was funny. So we're going to stick to ancient Greece, where we actually have people writing about what might have been comedy. So we've come out of the cave, and now we're talking about Aristotle now. Yes. So we're back in ancient Greece, where we're finding some of the early writings about humor. Well, not technically humor. We're talking about things like laughter or comedy, which may have meant slightly yeah. different things back then. So we've got a couple of quotes. So Plato held that people laugh at the misfortunes of others. And Aristotle used the term comedy, but he talks about how humor was an imitation of men worse than the average. But Aristotle, wasn't he known as a bit of a knob? Like, wasn't there a, like, there's a Greek comedy where uh, Aristotle was contemplating the clouds and a lizard (laughs) shit in his mouth? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that would be funny, and I would have laughed at that, and it possibly would have been vulgar. No, just like, what an awesome. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe didn't like that particular joke about him, so you got fuck here. It's all vulgar. You're all vulgarians. I'm Aristotle. No, no, that's what I yes. get from it. And, you know, and it's true, because I think these are the only people that wrote during that time, you know? Or the yeah. ones that we know of. Yes. You know, it, he, they were probably just very good at burying what they wrote. Yeah. Right, they're way better than what they wrote. They were they were better at sealing it off, keeping it. They were promoters. That happens today in show business. The best ones are the ones that are the best at getting it out there. Not necessarily what they're getting out there. It's just getting it out there and getting it read. Any of the ancient Greek philosophers, actually. Yes. So Plato sure. held right now, that sure. we right only now. laugh right at the misfortune yes, of others. Sure. And Aristotle said that so humor is the imitation of men worse than the average. And Cicero held with this, restricting humor to the unseemly or the ugly. So really, it sounds like back then, we would only make fun of or laugh at people who were sick or deformed or unwell in some way. Great. Great. (laughs) Great. So are you saying that humor in ancient Greece was purely vulgar in that respect? Well, this is where I was saying, I don't, I cannot imagine a society that didn't have mirthful laughter. And define the mirthful, happy, like what's, what's, what, when we say mirth mirthful? Mirth is that sort of joyous, happy, um, 
Life's great. At peace, contentment feeling that we have yep. when we laugh at stuff that is benign and unhurtful and non-hostile. And I can't imagine a people that just never laughed. And this is why I want to go back in time and make Aristotle laugh. To make him laugh, a mirthful laugh, where he's not looking down on me. Because he wouldn't, because he's just Aristotle. Coming up after the break. So it's... Diogenes. 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 Yep. Looks like genes. Diogenes. <laughs> Diogenes of Sinope. You're listening to Making Sense of Humor, and we will be right back. If someone hits you over the head with a coffee cup, have you been mugged? That's what I've got. If you need more, let me know. Bye. Welcome back. Picking up from where we left off. Diogenes of Sinope. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that really it? Unless it's pronounced Sinope. This episode, we're talking about the history of humor as far back as we can go. We're hovering around ancient Greece at the moment, and one of the most important figures of satire at that point was a person named... So it's... Diogenes. 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 Yep. It looks like genes. Diogenes. <laughs> Diogenes of Sinope. But anyway, so he's the, the earliest person that has been described as being a satirist. And he actually gave up all of his worldly goods and lived as a dog in the street to throw it into the rich people's faces, the hypocrisy of the way they were living. Mm -hmm. So he would literally live like a dog. He would crap in the streets and masturbate in front of everyone, walk around naked. And this was the earliest form of satire. A book by Rebecca Higgy. Actually, it's probably an article by Rebecca Higgy explains that this is where the word comes from, cynicism. Okay. And Kion actually has a K. Um, but this guy, who's, I'm not going to even try and say his name again, uh, lived like a dog. And he did this as satirical resistance in an attempt to bring about enlightenment. So it was that sense of if we go to complete uncivility, we can actually produce civility by showing people just how bad it could be, I suppose. <laughs> so the rich people walking around all high and mighty saying, oh, well, we can't laugh. That would, we would only laugh at people beneath us and it's vulgar and unseemly to laugh. So you can kind of get that sense of the hoi polloi of the ancient Greek world would have had their heads firmly shoved up their asses and maybe walking around naked and masturbating in the streets was the only way to sort of shock them out of their sort of elitist comfort. I can add, civility is a robe that people wear to hide their true selves. But I think it also goes with the idea that in comedy at that time, people were wearing all sorts of robes and masks and these giant fake phalluses. So it is that sort of sense of the robes we wear are what we are, not our true nature, which is, I guess in a way, speaks to the way that people would have saw the world back then. So it's not just us laughing at simple people, but only simple people laugh. So I had to call up another academic to see what he had to say about ancient Greece. Hello, Classic. Hi, this is Jay Brinker calling. Is this KO? This is. I'm KO John Gossard. I'm a senior lecturer in Classics at the University of Melbourne. First of all, the context in which he makes that statement about what comedy is, is a text that he wrote called The Poetics. Now, Aristotle was a uh, a great thinker, and he wrote lots and lots of stuff which I liken to Wikipedia. You know, if he was around today, he probably would have written Wikipedia. Okay. He liked to describe things, and he liked to find the origin of things. And when he tried to come up with a description of comedy, he really talked about it in contrast to the other genre of drama that the Athenians produced, which is tragedy. And so in his estimation, tragedy was a dramatization of stories of kings and queens and princesses and heroes from mythology, whereas comedy was representations of uh, lesser people, real-life people, average people. Also, in Greek comedy, uh, the actors would often wear grotesque costumes so that um, male characters would often have a flaccid phallus, you know, which is a representation of a male penis yeah. dangling in front of them. And they would often have uh, pot bellies and all actors in the ancient world wore masks. And 
comic masks t from that period tend to look kind of grotesque and uh, old and withered. So there's a kind of aesthetic of deformity that goes went along with the performance of comedy in the fifth century, and I think that's partly what Aristotle is getting at. Right. That the genre itself sort of glorified the, you know, the slightly ugly, the slightly okay. grotesque. <laughs> now you have to ask yourself, well, why is it that you know that's funny? Yeah. Uh, well, Aristotle does seem to say that there's, you know, part of what we laugh at is something that's less fortunate than ourselves. Um, I don't think he goes much far, very far to explain that psychologically. Coming up after the break. The ancient Greek philosophers aren't the only bit of information we have about humor. Okay. Ancient Greek medicine also used the word humor. <laughs> Just a doctor trying to legitimize his job. Like, this guy has an excess of blood. I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> Okay, two nuns are sitting on a park bench. A man in a trench coat runs up and flashes them. First nun has a stroke. Second nun tried, but she couldn't reach. Welcome back. Picking up from where we left off, you're listening to Making Sense of Humour. The ancient Greek philosophers aren't the only bit of information we have about humour. Okay. Ancient Greek medicine also used the word humor. Right. So when you say like vitreous humor or something like that. Exactly. It means a liquid as a fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, the vitreous humor is the fluid in your eye. Right. But back then they actually had an entire theory about wellness based on four different humors. Okay. That is yep. liquids. Right. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And the balance between these fluids was your wellness or unwellness. Interestingly enough, it's also even branched into explaining people's behaviors and personalities. So if you had an excess of blood, you would be considered sanguine. And your what temperament... Is that, what, does that, what does that mean to have an excess of blood? Well, <laughs> I don't actually know, but... If you thought about it. <laughs> just a doctor trying to legitimize this, his job. like, this guy has an excess of bl blood. I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 2,000-year-old Greek. Can we just give me a bit of slack, please? So they didn't actually clearly specify how much was too much. But basically, there was a certain balance between your four humors, whatever that balance was. Okay. So an excess of blood. An excess of blood created a temperament that is sanguine, which means that you're courageous, hopeful, playful, or carefree. Yep. So having a little extra blood doesn't seem to hurt. Phlegm, you'd be phlegmatic. And this is someone who's calm, thoughtful, patient, and peaceful. If you had an excess of yellow bile, you'd be called choleric. And this is somebody that might be ambitious, leader-like, restless, and easily angered. And then if you had an excess of black bile, you'd be considered melancholic. And this is somebody who may be more despondent, quiet, analytic, and serious. Interestingly enough, the word humor would have been used for completely different purposes. And everything. <laughs> and everything. Well, I mean, if you think about it, liquids, yeah. fluids, mm. they're everywhere. Yeah, they are. So this was <laughs> your four humors. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because this might actually be where the idea of being in a good humor came from. Oh, okay. So this is where it would have began. Oh, yeah. Although we should add that this is where the ideas of things like bloodletting came from. Really? To try and get your fluids into balance. So fluctuations in these <laughs> actually produce temporary changes, which you can kind of see. This if you lost a lot of blood, you'd probably behave differently. This guy's a terrible sense of humor. <laughs> Cut him. <laughs> so the idea of being in good humor may come from this idea of the four humors, which may actually mean that you're in a good mood, which may be somehow related to laughing or being funny. What we don't know is if Aristotle, growing up, seeing these depictions of comedy, 
led to his sudden belief that we would only laugh at people beneath us, or if society's belief that we would only laugh at people beneath us has led to this way of depicting comedy. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Sort of. So we just don't know which one came first. Chicken or the egg, kind of like who, who came first, like the society that says this or, you know, Aristotle growing up and then wrote about this. Exactly. So a lot of punching down. Yes. Unashamed punching down. Yes. Not even a concept of punching up at this stage. No. So just explain that concept. You know, essentially we can make fun of people below us, no qualms whatsoever. And the notion that we can actually make fun of people who are of higher status it's not something that's even addressed in ancient Greece, as far as we know. As far as we know, it sounds like it is all just playing the fool. Wow. And being a bit dopey, getting yourself into sticky situations because you misunderstood something, because you're not quite bright enough, you're not quite quick enough. Um, that's pretty funny. Which is <laughs> Three's Company. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. it's Three's Company. Mm. You know, it is, it is comedy based on misunderstandings. Yep. And, you know, and then hilarity mm. ensues. Mm. Coming up after the break. So this is actually the first kind of point where we see the word humor relating to something that actually might be funny. A horse walks into a bar and the barman says, why the long face? Welcome back. You're listening to Making Sense of Humor. All right, so I would go to 16th century France, where we see the word humaire, which at that time meant somebody who was unbalanced, which links back to our four humors. unbalanced humors. Got it. So this was uh, referred to any behavior that deviated from social norms. So it came to mean odd or strange. So this is actually the first kind of point where we see the word humor relating to something that actually might be funny. So prior to the 18th century, we're still looking at laughter in negative terms. Okay, so it's still quite clearly no distinction between laughing at and laughing with. There's a philosopher from the 1500s called Hobbes, uh -huh. and he believed that laughter stemmed from that sense of superiority, that when we laughed at others, it's because we saw ourselves as better than them. Well, there's here you go again. This guy sounds like a jerk. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, again, a jerk that writes to people, you know, there's, there's, a, got, there's got to be funnier, nicer ways of looking at laugh. <laughs> as a okay. sharing, wonderful human thing. This guy was cl clearly, look, these are angry nerds. <laughs> these, all these people you've talked about are angry nerds. Now... It's only the first, now with comedy, the angry nerds are now out there. They're the new superstars of comedy. That They find comedy wonderful, and they're laughing down their nose at everybody. So no, I, What kind of person comes up with these ideas? Why, why are his ideas so bleak? Well, it comes as a surprise for any student of Hobbes to, to learn that Hobbes had a theory of humor, uh, because Hobbes seemed a particularly um, unhumorous sort of character with a very bleak view of human nature. Jay sat down with Professor Paul Healy, who knows heaps about Thomas Hobbes, and shed some light on how he came up with his theories. Oh, okay. Epitomised famously in his view that uh, in the state of nature, that is in our natural state before we come into, uh, under the rule of the sovereign, we live in a state where a war of, of all against all, wherein people live in continual, this is a quote, people live in continual fear and danger of violent death. And hence, famously, quoting again, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Still, it is weird that you're writing about humor. <laughs> well, this is the funny time. thing. And Paul actually says, I was astounded that Hobbes had anything to do with humor. Mm. Paul's a philosopher. Mm. He is an academic researcher who studies philosophy mm. and had no idea that Hobbes had a theory of humor attributed to him. To set things in context, it's important to realize that he lived in the era early 17th century, the dawn of the so-called scientific uh, revolution, where uh, in contrast to Renaissance humanism, science was being discovered as the route to finding out the truth about ourselves. The challenge that confronted Hobbes as he saw it was how can we render peaceful coexistence with our fellow humans possible under these conditions. The only solution for Hobbes is for us to enter into a social contract that we surrender our unconstrained individual autonomy so that henceforth 
we will do only what is permitted by the laws of the sovereign and refrain from doing what the sovereign prohibits. So that's really interesting because if you've given up this, this right to aggress against your fellow citizen, then is humor basically flaunting your superiority, subverting that? Absolutely. It's a sort of cruel view in some respects. Mm. To an extent, we're laughing at other people's misfortune. Yep. As well as at our own superiority in seeing the humour in the situation. It's sort of surprising that, that Hobbes has a view of humour uh, attributed to him at all because his conception of human nature is not particularly humorous. He doesn't touch, on the, he doesn't touch frequently on, on the funny. Yeah. In fact, so far as my researches into Hobbes' view of humour goes, which is not standard fare for philosophers, he seems not to have written a lot about it. It's just a couple, a couple of passages at most in his yeah. in major political work, The Leviathan. It's a sort of an well, it's very much an aside, as I understand it, to his more well serious writing, uh, deadly serious writing, you might say. But we're a rather serious bunch, and you know, except on social occasions, perhaps it's not regarded as good reasoning to use humor to make your point. And we can say, well, first of all, he grew up when science was just becoming big, so we're now just machines. We are now just bones and muscles and vessels moving through space we have become objects it's no more about the soul now we're just things we're animals we're no different from dogs also he's around in a time of civil war he's watching his own countrymen kill his own countrymen so to come up with a philosophy where we're all just animals Mm. it's all war against war doesn't actually seem that far-fetched but it does make for a very negative view of humor Coming up after the break. Now, Don Rickles is the original insult comedian. And if you look at some of his stuff, he is quite harsh. Stay tuned because we'll be right back. Two muffins are sitting in an oven. The one muffin says, Whoa, it's getting hot in here. And the second muffin says, Holy shit, a talking muffin. Welcome back. Picking up from where we left off, you're listening to Making Sense of Humour. Superiority theory basically suggests that we only find things funny because we enjoy our position of height above whatever it is we're laughing at. Give me an example of something that you've laughed at where you really are laughing at someone who's beneath you. <laughs> you can't <laughs> out me like that. What are you doing? All right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, how about laughing at someone slipping on a banana peel? Hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Universally hilarious. What about laughing at somebody like Benny Hill? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that people aren't laughing at Benny Hill because they think he's clever. He is portraying somebody who's a moron. Yep. He always portrays someone who's an idiot. Mr. Bean. Yep. We laugh at Mr. Bean because Mr. Bean is a doofus. Yep. Not because Rowan Atkinson is stupid. Mm. He himself is brilliant playing someone stupid. Jackass. Perfect example. Exactly. But they're not characters. They can't be wholly stupid because I bet you they made a lot of money. Yeah, but at at the same time... Jackass, they knew that they were stupid. They go, look at me doing something stupid. Does that delete the point? No, because we're still laughing at the stupidity. Okay. So what is making us laugh is the behavior that is moronic. That's still meta because it's like, I know I'm stupid. I'm doing something stupid. Watch me as I staple this thing to my body. Whereas, Whereas normally... Normal superiority theory would say that we only laugh at things, but they don't know that they're doing the wrong thing. Original superiority theory would have at least posited that we laugh at things that are truly beneath us. So the person who would be truly beneath us wouldn't necessarily be wise to that. But <laughs> but. but now people that are very smart can play the role of someone stupid and we can still laugh. So, oh, maybe this is a difference, actually. Maybe maybe the, in, in the past, we were laughing at genuinely stupid people and we're like, ha ha, you are beneath me. Whereas now, we feel we have permission to do it because it's a character. 
it's a character. We're not actually laughing at that person. We're laughing at that character. Mike said something about that, didn't he? <laughs> it's, it's interesting, though, because insult comedy is big. Yeah, but I met, I just met Rickles. That's different. I met Don Rickles. He's like a god to me. Yeah. I met Rickles uh, this last summer in, in Montreal at the Fest. And his, calling somebody a hockey puck. Or well, my favorite line is, uh, what are you, Japanese? I'm Korean. What, that's better? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's just funny because it comes from a dumb guy. Yeah. Right. That's what makes it funny. He, he never professes to be a genius. He's not actually, say, he's just like a dumb guy. It's a dumb guy's talk. Yeah, that was going to talk. Uh, I like to corner that market, by the way. <laughs> dumb guy talking. He's getting old. He's up there. Yeah, he, like, I basically just talked about an old man about to die, but I made it funny. See, it's timing. <laughs> it's delivery. It's timing. It's your voice going up and now, down. Now, Don Rickles the is the original insult comedian. And if you look at some of his stuff, he is quite harsh. Filipino, my ass, you're a jap. I'll tell you in the jungle looking for your uncle. What am I bid for this broad before I introduce him? <laughs> Look at this, the old guy went, for a dollar. Is that your wife, sir? Jesus Christ. I'll tell you this. One of the things that I would like to just potentially raise as a issue is that if the dumb person is making the jokes, okay, yes. so as he says, Don Rickles, the joke about Japanese and Koreans not being any different, is coming from a dumb guy. Literally a dumb guy? Dunno. Even if it's a dumb character. The question is, is it that it comes from a place of ignorance rather than a place of malice? I kind of get it, but it's just such a complex emotion to have. To see people being laughed at and then what did you say? Okay, so when you see people being laughed at, yeah. we know that it hurts them when we see their reactions. Yep. That makes us uncomfortable. Like Mike says, he feels really awkward. Mm. That uncomfortable feeling we have is what prevents us from being hurtful. We need that aversive feeling yep. to help keep our own behavior in check. Right. As these shows play on and play on and we watch people being laughed at and we watch people being laughed at again and again, we feel less uncomfortable. <laughs> We no longer have that aversive emotion that keeps our own behavior in check. Right. And I think that's really important that this is where we're getting to. This is where you start to see society changing. This is where we start to see, okay, now we're talking about different things. We're starting to see humor in a different way because we're no longer bold faced laughing at people who are beneath us. Mm. We're starting to go, now we can't be so hurtful. Coming up after the break, he just comes off getting better and better with every one of his things. What a wonderful way to be philosophical about how great you are all the time and getting better. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Guy goes to a doctor and the doctor says, I've got good news and bad news. And the man says, okay, so give us the good news first. And the doctor says, you've got 24 hours to live. And the guy goes, that was the good news? What's the bad news? I should have told you yesterday. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to Making Sense of Humor with Jay Brinker and Bo Fitzpatrick. What do we hate more, ignorance or malice? Malice, one would assume. Well, the, yeah, okay. If you said something like, <laughs> when are you due? Yep. To me. Yep. I would be humiliated. And I would say But I'd exist. know that you didn't mean <laughs> I don't, I'd know that you didn't mean to be hurtful. Right. Whereas if you came up and said you're fat, then it would come from a place of malice. Yeah. You know, like when, when you tease somebody, your intent, mm. I think, has a lot to do with it. So yeah, so using laughter to ridicule. So we know laughter is meant to hurt. And we know this when we re watch the reactions of men who have been laughed at. Right. So that was one of the arguments is that we know that humor is designed to hurt when we actually see people's reaction to being laughed at. Right, right. Well, dynamite was invented to, you know, for people to build bridges and tunnels and, and for agriculture, not for killing each other. But, you know, some people it's like laughter. Some people say, fuck that, I'll use it for evil. Yes. It's a superpower. <laughs> you have to be very careful the way you wield laughter. 
It should be you laugh with. Comedy is about laughing with. Mm. I think. Mm. Yes. Uh, certain kinds of comedy is laughing at. I have trouble like Borat laughs at people. Mm. Or has you laughing at people. And I've always had trouble with fish in a barrel kind of comedy. I get very I get very awkward. What is that? Like even the office, the British one. Yeah. He does that so fucking well. Mm. I get very, very uncomfortable watching. I've never seen a whole episode. I right. can't. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people like that kind of laughter. I I think it's dangerous. Dangerous? Uh, yeah, I think it, it. I think in in many ways it dehumanizes you if you if you if if you're that willing to stand like behind it. Watching it in a film form or television film is like is 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 it's like watching it uh, on two way glass. This idea that it's dehumanizing us yeah. is taking away that awkwardness where we're no longer stopping our behavior because it's hurting someone, and that's the dangerousness. The more we see people being laughed at, the more we get the idea that that's okay, the more likely we are to lose our inhibition for hurting other people. And it's like we've, we're have we on some sort of sine wave up and down, up and down, civil, not civil. Yeah, but how did that happen? Wouldn't we be at the stage now where we're just like, oh, we don't laugh at that anymore? Yeah, you'd think so. And I think that it's so, interesting. Are we dipping into another dark ages? I think we are. <laughs> we're dipping. It's like, I think part of your brain says it's okay. I don't mm. think it is. It's like a lot of reality TV is funny because it's sad. Mm. Yes. Like this honey boo, I've never seen this honey boo boo thing. I have seen blurbs on television, but never on purpose. It was yeah. thrown in my face. <laughs> I think you always need to be on your A game every day. Like, not like every day, and, but you don't know if you're gonna be on the, your A game. A game or when you're gonna be on your A game. You need to be on your A game. But it looks like a like a little diabetic kid. It's it's you know going to die young, mm. being raised by uh, you know very very uh, ignorant people that poor that never. It's a sad sad thing. Do you reckon yeah. la Do you reckon laughing at has a good platform in comedy today? I don't. Uh, it, it it does for a lot of different kinds of comedy. I would suppose again that that uh, prank mm. uh, comedy is a lot of it is laughing at. It's not like. Um, it's not like Candid Camera, which mm. is the clever scenarios, come, but no one gets hurt. But a lot of people get hurt. Mm. And uh, that's not my cup of tea. Yeah. It's interesting because, like, you point out uh, Candid Camera or, or the stuff that was it? Just, Montreal Laughs, uh, Just for Laugh Gags. Oh, yeah, that, just, see, yeah. that shit drives me crazy. It's interesting because... Isn't that's it? so fucking French. <laughs> <laughs> what I was thinking was, it's interesting how they have the reveal at the end. It's like, you've been done the whole time. Yeah. And then they laugh. If they didn't have that, I reckon it would be the most unfunny show. I would No, I bet several people have probably been punched. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And they yeah. just don't make the edit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 no. Ha, ha, ha. We mm. were just... No. We, I know you thought his head fell off, but it did. Uh, we saw the fear of God in your eyes. That was hilarious. Remember yeah. when he started yeah. thinking about death in yeah. a very real You lost a year of your life. Camera's over there. Coming up after the break. Oh, everyone does. I just like the Germans came up with a name for it. Can you guess what German word he's referring to? That and more when we return. Uh, this blind man goes across the road with his with his guide dog, and the guide dog doesn't take proper due care and attention. The bloke's nearly run over and killed, and when he gets across the other side, he bends down and gives the dog a bodio, and the onlooker says, "That dog's just got you near, damn damn near killed, and you're rewarding him with a bonio. and the guy said, "Well, I want to check which end is which, so I could give him a good kick up the ass." Welcome back. You're listening to Making Sense of Humor. Schadenfreude is pleasure derived from the misfortune of others. The word is taken from German and literally means harm joy. It is the feeling of joy or pleasure when one sees another fail or suffer misfortune. I love to see it is also words. borrowed by some other languages. An English word of similar meaning is gloat, which means to feel or express great, often malicious, pleasure or self-satisfaction. 
there was something that you mentioned about what he was talking about with superiority theory, but I love this when he was talking. Can we talk about Schadenfreude? Oh sure. Let's talk about like give us your opinions on that. If you if you have any, if you've ever thought about laughing at the misfortune of others, <laughs> never. <laughs> oh come on, you're Canadian. You have laughed at people oh, slipping on. Oh, everyone lives. does. <laughs> I just like that the Germans came up with a name for it. <laughs> I think I, I prefer our society, the non-German society that just pretended it didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> if someone deserves it, then yes, of course, have a good laugh. Mm. Uh, what, yeah. How do, what, what's your What's your comedy for about for people who don't know it? Like, uh, does it does it use that? Uh, uh, no. Well, on myself. Right. I don't. I'm not a finger pointer. Okay. Uh, uh, I do a little bit of finger pointing, but it, mostly at me mm. and uh, my life. It's very uh, chronological. Mm. It's uh, it's uh, it's how I, I look at my life and and all my kids' lives and my family. Not in a cutie poo way. It's my show is quite uh, rude. We, but, we uh, love that. Well, so do I. Can't stand. I don't, plus, I don't I don't trust a clean agenda because every clean comic I've ever met is a bit of a prick. Oh, what, what <laughs> do you think? Oh, about? Yeah, Bill Cosby. We all know what he does <laughs> after work. <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah, 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 allegedly. I saw your followers. There's nine people following you right now. Come on, this is episode one. That's wonderful. I think I think shouting get more people following. Actually, oh, I don't even know I have microphone. So, Schadenfreude, pleasure derived from the misfortune of others. Sounds like it would be related to superiority theory, where we're laughing at the misfortune of others. But I guess in this instance, we don't necessarily have to laugh. It is just being happy that someone else is unhappy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> that they created a word for that is great. A bit about Mark Wilmot there. It was great to actually talk to him about Schadenfreude because I kind of feel like his comedy is yes, very Jim. much laughing at the expense of himself. Jay, can you talk to me about um, laughing at our former selves? Because I'm, oh. a bit, I'm a bit confused with this. <laughs> this. This is, okay, so this is what happens when a philosopher encounters a problem with their theory. Because somebody asked Hobbes, well, what about when we laugh at ourselves? How can we be superior to ourselves? And Hobbes said, well, if we are laughing at ourselves, we're laughing at our former selves. <laughs> oh, so man. we've learned and we're better now. So that is how we maintain that sense of superiority. What a, what a prick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> So, I mean, if you're he just comes off getting better and better <laughs> every one of his th- what a wonderful way to be philosophical about how great you are all the time and getting better from even when I thought of that right now it's better than that oh, oh I'm smarter now oh, now even smarter even knowing that I'm now even more and future me is bright future me thinks I'm an idiot yeah. that's what he's basically saying future you thinks you are an idiot so you're going through your life following in the footsteps of genius. <laughs> <laughs> that's starting to make more sense now. Like that he's just like, this is life shit apparently. Like, that's Hobbes basically. He's like, life shit. I guess people laugh at time to time. But if they do, or it's because of this. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, that life is shit. People are awful. Mm. The only reason that we main citizen any sense of civility is to remain citizens. We give up our horrible urges to be part of society. But when we laugh, we do so in a cruel way. We've come to the end of the first part of episode one. Next week... So we've got people like Kant and Schopenhauer who are coming up with a different theory, and this is the incongruity theory, that we laugh at things that are incongruous. They don't fit together. They don't work together. And when you bring them together, it's silly or absurd. And that's funny. So we don't have to hear from Hobbes anymore. No more Hobbes. Let's let's look at humor in a much more fun, healthy, happy way. Immanuel Kant was fun and happy, was he? (laughs) (laughs) And you've been listening to Making Sense of Humor. Thanks for listening to the program, and thanks tonight to Mike Wilmot, Professor Paul Healy, Dr. K.O. Chong Gossard, and all of our many joke tellers. A special thanks to Natalie Livingston, who helped us with the production of our initial episodes and in the creation of this podcast. And a special thanks to Matt Saraceni and the people at Omni who are helping to support this podcast. Next time on the podcast, we bring you part two of I Want to Make Aristotle Laugh, where we continue our discussion on the history of humor. It's like, uh, I think it was Betty Davis about uh, a death scene. 
And he, she said to the director, oh, dying is easy, comedy's hard. Yeah. And I always thought that that's beautiful. Because it is a lot, to make it look easy is, is a life's work.